Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for being here this morning. We're really excited about this panel. Uh, my name is Jessica Finley Yang, and I'm the social media director for Meg Quigley. This event will be in English, but live Spanish interpretation is provided, and you'll see an interpretation button, button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Simply select your preferred language to hear an audio translation, and to translate for us today, we have our wonderful translator, Rick Barantes. Welcome, Rick. Thank you. Hola a todos, mi nombre es Rick Barantes, y estoy muy emocionado de estar traduciendo esta importante charla. Eh, para escuchar la traducción deben seleccionar el botón que dice Translation abajo en su pantalla y luego el que dice Spanish. Espero que disfruten este evento. Thanks, Rick. Um, I'm really looking forward to today's, to today's panel, which is titled Decentering Whiteness in Bassoon Pedagogy, Performance and Community Engagement. The chat is open for conversing with each other and commenting on the session. Um, you won't be able to see my video during this session, but I will be moderating the chat. Please be respectful, kind, and thoughtful in your comments and reactions. This is a space for learning and a place for getting better. Some topics that we discuss might be new to some people, but we're hoping this will be a place for all of us to grow in understanding and commit to change in our own lives and practice. The Q&A function at the bottom of your screen is available if you'd like to ask the panelists a specific question. And now please welcome our panelists, Gina Moore, Midori Sampson, Maya Stone, Leah Uribe, and Jacqueline Wilson. Well, first and foremost, good morning to everybody. I thank you so much for being here this morning with us. I'm really excited to get this started. Uh, just to let you all know, this is a safe and inviting space. You are a part of our conversation. We're not gonna change our entire space in 55 minutes, but the goal of this is to give everyone applicable strategies to use in their daily lives in bassooning or beyond to create a more equitable space for everyone around us. My name is Gina Moore, and I'm a freelance bassoonist and diversity advocate based in Dallas, Texas. Me and my esteemed sheroes on this panel came to this topic as a result of our unique experiences studying bassoon from our early days all the way into our professional careers. I want to let each panelist introduce themselves briefly, and then we're going to go ahead and get started. Hi everyone, my name is Midori Sampson. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I'm calling from Ho-Chunk land, also known as Madison, Wisconsin to some people. Um, I'm bringing to this conversation a couple of lenses. Um, first, my experience as a biracial woman, my mom is white and my dad is mixed Japanese and Filipino. And I've certainly benefited from being white enough and privileged enough in a lot of spaces, especially in music. But I also carry with me the story of my grandfather's really treacherous immigration to the US from the Philippines in the 40s. And especially um, the my, my grandmother's incarceration in the internment camps in World War II. Um, and that, of course, really influences the way I see the world and and the the her trauma has had serious impacts on our family and um, how I approach this topic. Um, the other lens that I'm bringing to this is uh, from social work. Um, I have spent my career seeing how my really traditional training as a bassoonist had a lot of blanks in it. Um, definitely about social justice and race. And, and I find that classical music doesn't necessarily have the vocabulary to talk about those things. And so I've tried to do a serious exploration in social work um, to kind of fill in those blanks in my knowledge. Um, for my doctoral research and for my dissertation, I'm working on taking different frameworks from the discipline of social work and writing a new framework that musicians can use that use um, tenets from social justice to make sure that we are creating more anti-oppressive, anti-racist spaces um, based on social work's commitment to social justice. Those are the couple of lenses that I bring here. Thanks, everybody. I'll go ahead and go next. 
Um, my name is Maya Stone, and I am a freelance musician um, from Nashville, but by way of really Troy, New York, my hometown, which is in upstate New York um, near Albany. Um, I have an extensive background in uh, higher education, having taught in full-time academic positions um, at four different universities over 10 years in the past. And um, I've also served on Regional Orchestra Players Association, um, the executive board for four years. And um, I'm also a recitalist and masterclass clinician. And um, I have I play with or sub in uh, many orchestras. <laughs> um, I feel very fortunate to be involved with a couple of um, innovative chamber ensembles as well in the Nashville area. And um, I come from, as far as my background is concerned, um, I'll just share with you um, just growing up being um, an uh, African-American or a black woman. Um, I've noticed um, opportunity or noticed instances where um, I was I was I was marginalized um, throughout my education or um, uh, just throughout life in general. And, you know, it's at the moment, it's not really clear about how to deal with that. I think a lot of times, especially in the past, I feel like this generation is a lot different now. <laughs> but um, when things happen to you, it's kind of like a, a instant shock, you know, and um, and then kind of this sort of. Um, processing that goes on in the mind and then um, maybe it's put somewhere in the, in the back, you know, but um, those things tend to affect us, you know, over time. And so um, also I'll just share that um, when I was in undergrad um, and, and of course I, I, things change over time and how we process things and uh, what we do with the information that we have, but um, in undergrad where I received a, a fabulous education and I, um, I loved all of my dear teachers. Um, I experienced a moment in time, I'll say, where uh, I didn't know how I fit into the, the, the world of classical music. And, um, and it didn't seem like it was for me and it didn't seem like um, uh, there was a place for me. And um, and I thought maybe I need to not do this. <laughs> and uh, so um, it just happened that there was an Africana studies program that just started like my, like the beginning of my junior year or something like that. And um, it was a, a professor that had come in and, you know, decided that he was gonna take this on. And um, being at a liberal arts school, I had a whole bunch of general, um, a whole bunch of classes outside of music that I needed to take. And, but it just happened that a bunch of these classes worked really well for um, uh, me, both music and Africana studies. And so I was able to take a lot of different music classes like jazz history, and then, um, some outside African-American rhetoric and, you know, just all kinds of classes that all of a sudden allowed me to see, oh, like I ne didn't necessarily think my place in classical music, but I thought uh, like I have a place in this world and I, I, can, I can do this, I fit here. So, um, so that's kind of a little bit of my, my perspective and, and my background. Hello, everybody. I am Leo Uribe. I am calling from Fayetteville, Arkansas, where I teach at the University of Arkansas in the music department. Um, I come here with many identities. Um, you know, the ones I uh, carry with uh, lots of pride, that of a mother as a woman, immigrant. And uh, I represent many people, and I'm very proud to have gained that trust and that place to be able to sit here and speak on behalf of the ones that are still looking for their voices or looking for safe platforms to be able to uh, connect, express, and uh, share their experiences. Um, I have been able to do that, especially lately in this conversation about uh, race identity, social and creative justice uh, has been in my mind for the longest time through the, my music, through the bassoon, through my research, uh, but especially this last year has been uh, at the top of my thoughts, uh, my sleepless nights, 
and uh, and many many other you know deep emotions and at the same time deep um, you know uh, strength and and more and more so just to be able to to talk about it and to try to the best of my abilities to move some change. I'm very appreciative of this opportunity to be here and share this time with you and um, uh, look forward to this, to this conversation. Sheikh Maitske, Ink Nash for Nick Show Jacqueline Wilson, Washington Yakima Knick, Ink Nash for Subsequashla Kwashla Nushamash. Good morning. My name is Jacqueline Wilson. I come here as a representative from the Yakima Nation and I teach at the University or Washington State University, new position as assistant professor of the SUN uh, here on the ceded lands of the Nimipu in Pullman, Washington. I use the bassoon as a tool to approach decolonization and the thwarting of expectations surrounding Native identity. I like to collaborate with Indigenous composers to collaborate, commission, perform, and premiere their works. And I'm super excited about this panel, the spirit of community and collaboration, and I can't wait to get started. First and foremost, thank you to all these incredible women for taking the time to spend a few few hours of their days with me over the last few months collaborating on these things. I just wanted to remind everybody that you are more than welcome to participate in our chat because you, at the end of the day, you are a part of our conversation. It's based on a concept called agency. There's nothing about us without us. And this is the basis of decentering whiteness in this conversation. First things first, what does it mean to decenter whiteness? I know we've seen many panels over the summers and many documents from DEI policies at our schools, but what does it mean to decenter whiteness? It means flipping the script to allow marginalized identities to exist and perform in classical music spaces. We want to bring humanity back into music making. The monolith of our humanity is not white centric. Therefore, the diversity in the communities we service and participate in are a part of a cyclic function. In our presentation today, we're going to focus on three key parts of this function, pedagogy, performance, and community engagement. Each of us are going to tag team to give you a strategy and a little bit of background information. And we're going to leave 20 minutes at the end of this panel for a very large Q&A. If a question of yours is not answered by any of us during this panel or at the end of the Q&A, we did leave our contact information on the handout if you would like to connect with us further. So I'm going to I'm going to tag Midori and we are going to talk a little bit about pedagogy. A reminder for our lovely audience that if BIPOC is mentioned in our conversation, it means black indigenous persons of color. You ready, Midori? I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So the very first things we're going to do in every topic is give you the context of what's happening now and what can change. So what are we facing now in pedagogy? What do you think, Midori? Okay, so I, I problematize the way we teach often by using um, Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And he said that, very generally, he said that um, if we are treating students like they are empty vessels and we need to fill them with knowledge, and that we are the expert and that they have no experiences as individuals and as people who are in the world and know a lot about music already, um, then we are mirroring colonization and oppression in the way we teach. Um, and I think back to like theory classes where I had to sit and stare and memorize um, and it didn't acknowledge that I was a person and knew a lot already. Um, so I, in my teaching, try to, in every way, subvert this idea that my students know nothing, um, and that I know everything. Absolutely. So the problem we're addressing is there's a setup somewhere in our system that there is one person who tells us what repertoire is good and what should be held, what values in music should be held above everything else. And what we value as bassoon players impacts our students' understanding of the repertoire we pick and what value they place on certain styles. 
So this, it's about this other concept as well of what gives us Eurocentric credit. You're a great bassoonist if you play blank. You have value in our field if you do blank very well every single day of the week. So decentering whiteness in our pedagogy space is going to be about creating more empathetic and informed learning spaces for ourselves and for future students. We want to restructure the framework of standard repertoire conventions. So the strategies that we have come up with together as a team, the first one in the pedagogy topic is celebrating yourself and others. For marginalized communities, that means embracing yourself and who you are and respecting the background in which you grew up in. For me, I grew up in a very poor environment. I didn't have access to bassoon until I got to college. And a lot of times my background wasn't celebrated at my public white institution. And as a result, I had to really find more ways to celebrate myself through my master's degree and through my diversity work after school. But if you happen to lie in a majority, that means rebalancing yourself. So not just taking the time to say, oh, I'm a great person because I'm engaging in this conversation and I'm trying every single thing that these women talk to me about today, but rebalancing it in a way of understanding where you exist in the structure and also taking the time to work with your students to create more empowering opportunities with them to be celebrated. So treat yourself and everyone else around you like you're able to succeed. We do not need to stereotype our students based on the way they look or the way they talk because these create additional barriers to their future in music education. At the end of the day, you can't empower others if you can't empower yourself and celebrate yourself existing in this space. And the second strategy we would like to talk to you a little bit about, and I'll let Midori tag on this because she's very passionate about <laughs> this particular one, is reframing the standard repertoire. Yeah, I, you, you say the word, reframing and it's really it's really nice and i say the word reject which is like the less <laughs> nice version of that um <laughs> but but one of the things that i have in my syllabus at the university of wisconsin stevens point is asking my students to like reject the term standard repertoire um or at least reframe it like you said so nicely um that nobody you, you kind of mentioned this already, but nobody is the arbiter of what is good and what we should uphold above everything else. Um, and we really do this with repertoire. Um, it's, yeah, there, there is no such thing as standard, I think. Absolutely. So I have one, one more thing we wanna add back to the, reje the reframing of the repertoire. And that's bringing yourself and your humanity back into your music making, which we talked about in the very beginning. I'd like to do a little activity with you all before we transition to my next power team for the performance topic. I would like everybody, if you are comfortable and or able, to put in the chat a favorite piece of yours that you've learned to play. It can be anything. It can be a pop tune. It can be a samba line. It can be anything you want. Fantastic. Beesh, I do not share that favorite piece. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. <gasps> Lee, yes, let it go. <laughs> As everybody's typing in their answers into the chat, I want everyone to think about where those pieces have been programmed. Have they been played in a concert hall, a recital stage, a large popular music venue, a studio space, or in a practice room? A lot of these beautiful works sometimes don't make it out of our practice room and studio spaces. For example, oh, that was a fun one too. Uh, yeah, for example, oh, thanks, Ryan, that's awesome. I personally loved learning. I did a R&B mixing of a bunch of Meg Thee Stallion and Beyonce tunes that I found so much joy in producing and playing, but I don't know if they'll ever make it to the stage where I can share my background with everyone else. 
And I think it's important to remember all these beautiful things that we're learning about in our practice spaces, we want to share in the performance hall and with our communities. And with that, I'm gonna tag Dr. Eribe and Dr. Stone, and we're gonna have a little talk conversation about the performance strategies that you can use. Take it away, ladies. Actually, I think it's going to be Jackie, Jackie Wilson. Jack and Maya, yes. My apologies. <laughs> no problem. Wilson. I'm sure we can all talk about this topic. <laughs> <laughs> Jackie, do you want to go first? Sure. I guess um, when I'm thinking about um, approaches to repertoire, you know, one thing that I really try to keep in mind is the relational nature of the things, the feelings we have toward the pieces that we play. And that that's not unique to quote unquote diverse repertoire or, um, you know, being less homogenous in the types of music we play and by whom it's written. Uh, it's typical to say, oh, I, I love playing Baroque music or I, you know, specialize in such and such or I'm particularly invested in or I'm, I'm doing a project where I'm learning all the Vivaldi concertos or Deviant Sonatas or whatever it is, right? Um, the idea of us as musicians having long-term relationships where we uh, get to know certain periods of time artistic perspectives, voices, um, that's very typical, right? We're used, to, we're trained um, and used to investing in that way. And I think if we can, you know, in terms of considering this um, normalizing versus, versus tokenizing question that we wanted to bring up, one way to approach that is to view maybe repertoire that's new to you or composers that are new to you in a way that is normalizing. How would you go about learning, studying, getting to know any other type of repertoire? Um, what standards would you have for learning Mozart, you know, and learning about uh, his cultural context or historical context and that type of thing? And yes, you can do the same thing with William Grant still, and, and we should. That's what we're trained to do, right? Right? And so having a longstanding relationship with different types of pieces, committing to playing them more than once, committing to playing them over the long term, right? Assigning them more than once. Uh, that's one thing that has been uh, really effective in terms of my, I guess, diversifying of my repertoire. But I just kind of think of it as, you know, playing music that I enjoy, really. I don't know. What do you think, Maya? Just listening to you talking and thinking that's so hard. <laughs> it's just so hard. And because, you know, we've we've just been so used to approaching, you know, one particular aspect of of uh, classical music, you know, and and that's um, predominantly white, you know, Western European ish white men you know what i mean like so it's it's just so hard to like see outside of that and i'm like man that's i want to do that so bad <laughs> you know? like, and i'm trying i'm really trying <laughs> um but yeah it's good it's good like it's so it's just so funny because it's it's really good to hear this every time you know <clears throat> and we've been talking about this but like it's so good to hear it coming you know, it's, it's good to hear it come out of your mouth another time. You know what I mean? It's like, I got to hear this again because this is hard, you know? <laughs> but um, yeah, so I would, you know, I agree. Look for excuses and opportunities um, to use marginalized composers and musicians. And um, that issue of marginalization versus token tokenization, um, starting to see, which Jackie, it sounds like you're doing this, but starting to see um, marginalized composers as the norm. And, you know, we, you know, they, they are marginalized, but, you know, when, when will we get to the point where they're not? Like, we don't, we don't see them as, you know, we see them as composers and not like this, like, well, either you're going to use marginalized composers or you're not, you know what I mean? But maybe we can get to the point where, you know, that's not even... Um, uh, an issue that's not even a, a term but um, 
So like music has only really included white men, you know, for so long. And um, when, when historically referred to uh, classical music, and this was just a given and something we relegated ourselves to and with almost no questions at all, right? Um, uh, currently, uh, due to efforts of individuals with clear plans and collectives, some organizations, uh, historical issues of injustice that have brought these things to light, and dare I say technology and the internet, um, our eyes are being opened, right, to far more thought and um, teaching that openly acknowledges uh, this, but it's, it's not enough. Um, so, and it's like clear, that just has to be continually more and um, this, it's going to demand drastic change in approach um, in, in, to all these things, education and pedagogy and, and um, our, our uh, concepts of things. Um, but it will, it will have to happen, you know, at some point if we want true progress. And I know we're talking about it, right? Right here, right now. So, um, and, and there's so many others that are talking about it right now. And that's great. Um, when we add these, the, pers the aspects of um, different identities and cultures, um, we have to be extremely conscious about the effect it has on what is already established in our minds. Um, and it's so what's already established is really, really powerful. Um, it's playing in a style outside of, uh, it, it's uh, playing in a style outside of um, what, we, what we deem as the norm. Um, you know, is that's is that difficult? You know, um, I keep going back to I keep thinking about Amy Pollard's presentation of um, mindfulness and focus uh, that she did um, the other day. It was so fantastic. And if you haven't gotten, um, if you didn't go, then uh, get your hands on on the handout if you can. Um, but it it was really fantastic and. Um, uh, I want to say about, about that. Um, I'm just going to say um, right now because I'm missing some of my notes, but <laughs> that, um, the focus was really on um, ex kind of um, getting out of your, um, uh, I want to say like getting out of your, your head, I want to say, and just, um, um, but accepting though that you have a head, if that makes sense. And um, so we, there are issues that we deal with and, um, and thought patterns that we have and we've, we should accept them and not beat ourselves up, you know, for having them and for, for thinking a certain way, but, um, but be conscious of that. And through, you know, mindfulness and, and the meditation, you can start to be aware, you know, you're becoming aware of yourself, becoming aware of your thoughts, becoming aware of um, what's happening with your body and in essence, uh, becoming aware of your surroundings and, um, and, and other people and um, becoming more uh, empathetic and, um, and acknowledging, you know, and so, um, in that process, we start to, I think we can really start to open ourselves up a little bit more to, um, to change in a way. So, um, so I think this is, this is really, really important in terms of the process that we're, we're going through when we're trying to, to change repertoire, when we're trying to wrap our heads around, you know, how, like, how are we going to accept, you know, someone else? How are we going to think of these other composers of, of unmarginalized, of, you know, of not marginalized? Um, and, you know, how are we going to then also, it, us in terms of talking with, with other people and, and people who are not marginalized, but also other people who are talking, who, who are allies or who want change and who are talking to people who may not, potentially want change, you know? Um, so all of these things I think are important when we talk about the conversation of, of repertoire, you know, um, because it's, it's hard. It's hard to get our heads outside of, of what, what has been normal, what has been normalized. And um, let's, yeah, let's take that tokenization and let's, let's convert it. 
to normalization. I hope that made some sort of sense. (laughs) May may I add a quick thought? I am having about marginalization and normalization and uh, communities that are marginalized are in the margin. We need to bring an in, right? We need to talk about this uh, rebalancing of the structures and it comes not only from us choosing repertoires from every uh, you know, stage of power, right? So um, somebody in the chat is talking about, well, we have to prepare our students for auditions when we have to disrupt and challenge uh, what is the repertoire in those auditions, right? What is the repertoire in those orchestras? Who's making those decisions? So um, I think it is important to, to think broadly about those decisions come from us and they're important, but there are many other instances that have to partake, right? And especially, I call to people with power, right? And we know where that power has been, right? And uh, when we talk about decentering whiteness, we're talking about that that whiteness has been in charge, right? And still, that's what we need, those voices to uh, advocate uh, to, again, you know, disrupt, disrupt for us, for the marginalized uh, communities. Uh, Call it women, call it people of color, call it whatever um, you want you want to call it. The other thing that to me has been very clear is that those decisions about uh, repertoire have uh, deep implications in that power again, right? So we experience in our communities a uh, lack of representation, women composers, right? Uh, there's uh, cases of sexual abuse in our communities as well, in the music community, sexual violence, um, power in that respect as well. Well, we need to use what we have in hand, choosing that repertoire to rebalance because those are lines that are connected, right? How do we see women uh, professionally? How do we see women in general? How do we see people of color professionally? How do we see them uh, uh, from the human perspective? So uh, I think it's because of that is our responsibility, all of us to rebalance that power structure and repertoire is a way to do it. Yeah, and I'd just like to piggyback on that. Um, kind of discussion of the macro with acknowledging, I think you referenced this, Leah, too, Stacey's comment about feeling pressure um, to teach standard things over other types of things, which is kind of a a micro question uh, in terms of like, what do I assign? Um, My friend Matthew has this phrase who says, yes, and, and I always think, uh, you know, yes, uh, and we decide what is standard. Right. So uh, I had someone say to me just today, isn't standard just what gets played all the time? And it's like, yes. And we decide what gets played all the time. You know, when quarantine started and people were doing a lot of unaccompanied pieces, I heard maybe like a dozen people do Jenny Brandon's Colored Stones this summer. And it's been a piece for a international uh, competition is not Colored Stones standard repertoire now. How did that happen? We played it over and over and over. And so we decide what the standard repertoire is and pragmatically, do our students need to learn Saint-Saëns? Sure. Can they learn one movement this semester and a couple movements of Adolphus Hailstark's bassoon set? Yes. And if that happens every semester, student after student, then we, we decide what the standard repertoire is. And that's something that we are uh, autonomous over as a field. And so if we don't do that, then we also must acknowledge that that's something we are consciously conscientiously opting into and decisions that we're not making purposefully. Yeah, I'll just add to that. Um, like organizations like make quickly, you know, like, I mean, they they they've added um, pieces by present you know living female composers like the Jenny Brandon and like Dreamy in Colors and you know all of these these pieces that they've used for the competition and those are exposing these women to brand new pieces you know these young women who are just coming up and and that is changing the field so just like you said so I mean it's happening already and. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm, I, I've struggled with this, you know, time and time again. So, um, you know, I've, I've had a, um, I, I was talking about this recently, but um, I had a, a older student, um, a senior in high school, and he was doing a senior recital, and we were talking about what can he, when he, what can he play? And I was thinking of all these pieces that I love, and. And I, and I had actually like come up with the entire program and they were all white men, <laughs> like all of them dead. 
And I was like, oh, shoot, you know, and I looked at it and it's just, you know, goes to, you know, taking the time to, to if, if that can happen, you know, taking the time to just look at it and, and acknowledging it and seeing, oh my gosh, you know, like this is what I'm thinking. Okay, let's get out of this box a little bit. And um, if, um, if you can, you know, like add, add another piece if there's something that's accessible and there always is, right? There are always pieces that are accessible. So add those pieces, you know, in or add one in. It's okay, you know, it's okay. Like you don't have to reinvent the wheel, you know, in a day. So it's okay if you just add one piece, you know, like um, Jackie was saying, uh, you know, you can add one movement from the Hale Stork, you know, you can add one movement from Jenny Brandon. Um, it was really heartfelt to me to hear um, my my student uh, who played at a master class earlier the, um, in the uh, pre-college program. She said, um, you know, it it brought her so much joy to play the Brandon, you know, the Jenny Brandon. And she's she's in high she's a tenth grader in high school, and to hear that, you know, it's like I don't want to get emotional. Good gracious, but you know. <laughs> like really makes me feel good you know that and that you know change is happening and it's not a change that's bad we I think we have to really remember that there's enough for everybody you know and um Chimamanda Adichie you know has a great quote um that goes uh the danger of a single story is not that it is untrue but that it is incomplete you know so we want to take the opportunity to 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 give the full picture, you know, and especially to our young people coming up. I love that, Maya, and you're talking about representation and how, you know, those decisions really help our self-esteem and getting away from this, uh, you know, uh, assimilation we're, we're, we have gone through. Maybe we can transition to community to talk a little bit more about uh, that in that context, um, Gina. Absolutely, and we are, Funneling through all of your questions, we're trying to leave a big gap of time for um, community engagement, and we will touch back on some of those points that the ladies made about repertoire as well when we present the handout at the end of our session. Um, when we're talking about community engagement, we're focusing on the areas in which we impact. So sometimes the communities that we service look different than the patrons that are in our recital halls or the patrons that come to our school of music concerts. And I think it is so incredibly important to create this mindfulness approach when we are engaging with our communities instead of I'm in this orchestra and I need to perform this community concert because I'm contractually obligated to do so. Instead of making it transactional, aiming for this approach of we're here to service our communities and we want to bring music back to them from our understanding of what we've been learning and the kinds of humans that we're synthesizing ourselves to be in the bigger picture structure. Um, and the one thing I want to highlight is that we all do a very excellent job of one-on-one -on -one engagement. I think that is something in general we are pretty successful at. We can go into a school and present chamber music or present a concert. The kids love it, we love it, we move forward. But the issue I feel personally as someone who's multiracial and grew up in a very, in a 90% African-American community is what is the connection long-term? We can't use our saviorism to go into community once and say, oh, we've made an impact and then I can move forward. So what I wanna to talk to you all a little bit about are some strategies you can do in your communities. And I wanna go, I wanna approach this from a three-tier perspective. So the micro going to the macro. So the first one we're gonna talk a little bit about is that what you can do as an individual, and that is making your community work a little bit more personable. If you have the opportunity to work at a school or with a district, take the time to have a conversation with a student. They, they're so excited that you're there and they just wanna to talk to you. And who knows, you having that one conversation with, you know, a little, a little black girl could change her life. I mean, it did for me. I didn't think music was a thing I could do until I saw, you know, a black woman playing the bassoon saying, you can totally do this. Yeah, that's a thing. That's your thing. You can do that. So being more personable and build the connections with the volunteers and the students that you interact with, because the more community you can build, the more partnering with other you engage with and practice having these conversations, the better you're going to feel about them in the long run. 
And I want to tag Midori for the second strategy, and then we're going to move to the third, and then we're going to have a big Q&A in the next few minutes. Take it away, Midori. Um, yeah, so this three-tiered approach, I, again, I come to this from social work because this is how social workers um, design interventions. So thinking first at micro, which is individuals, middle, mezzo, um, communities and groups, and then macro policy and systems. Um, I, I want to give I want to give a really specific example of a project I worked on in Chicago with the Civic Orchestra of Chicago and the Chicago Symphony. Um, we did a extended um, partnership with um, Notes for Peace, which is an organization that uh, leads songwriting workshops with parents who've lost their children to gun violence. Um, and so there, there was the opportunity to do like, like musicians have been so good so far about one time visits and engagement moments of, like you said, like a school concert or like a library concert. And I guess the micro in this situation would have been if like the Chicago symphony had done a concert at this church and then the interaction ended there. But instead it was that musicians were helping to write songs and to give voice to these stories that were real people's lived experiences. And so it was, yes, there was like, I think there was an interactive concert that happened, but more importantly, it was um, more long-term where there was songwriting going on with this community. There was this huge band of people who were writing songs together. Um, and, and at the macro level, this project, um, got the the yo-yo ma was involved with this project and having him as a spokesperson for an initiative is really awesome so these songs then became a tool for actually demanding policy change around gun violence um and that's more of the kind of deeper and long-term community engagement that i wish we saw that didn't just stop at the one time library concert, but actually could have tangible tools for demanding policy change um, at the end of the interaction. Does that make sense? Okay. Absolutely. What's up, Leah? Hey, <laughs> I just, uh, that is uh, fantastic. I just, um, I just wanted to point out to everybody attending this um, this conversation today that we are all, uh, you know, members of different communities. You know, this this right now is a community, right? We are affecting each other. We are here together by a common intention to have this conversation and live with something that is going to help us change the world. We have community in our orchestras and chamber ensembles. We have community in our studios. We have community in our larger communities. I work a lot with my community uh, in uh, in Fayetteville, where I live, and um, I think uh, you know we musicians have a, a great voice, right, and the ability to transform and to reach out to a lot of people, or to a little as as we want to, right, or need to. Uh, but I just want I've been thinking about these issues of community a lot this last year with uh, some projects I am uh, I'm leading here in my community. I think that. We need to reflect on our social role as healers and how do we bring music to heal not only the effects of COVID right now in our uh, communities, but also the effects of racial uh, tension, uh, social injustice, creative injustice. So uh, I, I just want to invite everybody to think about in terms of our communities, how is our role right there? The other thing that is important for us as community is how are we going to amplify the voices of leaders uh, of uh, color, of marginalized uh, communities' leadership, right? And how this is an important time to think about community in that, uh, from that perspective of uh, pipeline leadership. Uh, how are we going to, you know, make those voices uh, be heard and and help in any way support those voices, especially of younger people. I think that that's, that's our our job. Um, also, I think it's super important for us right now to reflect on social entrepreneurship, right? And uh, how we, the situation that we are, many uh, 
freelancers, many people in orchestras or without orchestras right now, how we are going to uh, make sure arts and music are sustainable. So all of those are issues as community we're here to, um, to connect with and to support. And I just want to add one thing, our example of community and make quickly. I think this week has been a very important example of how to work with community and to do everything right to uh, to emphasize those voices and especially if you look back at every concert every panel every uh, make talk everything the representation of everybody and how much we have the power and everybody in this conversation in these rooms have the power to 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 do to the center whiteness to change and challenge those uh, old standards beautifully said leah absolutely and what we're trying to share with you today, just to wrap up, I wanna make sure we transition to Q&A so we have all the time in the world for the questions, I hope, is that we're trying to, we're, we're reframing everything that has been talked about previously and giving you strategies for moving forward. So after hearing Leah and Midori talk about their projects, I pulled out two main strategies that they've been using in their communities. The first one is researching first, programming second. So look into the demographic of the communities that you're servicing and then move forward with representative programming that that literally celebrates the students and or the adults that you're engaging with. That because by building that relationship with, I've taken the time to have a conversation, I've taken the time to do this with you, we're moving forward in that way. And it's baby steps. It won't be all inclusive programming or new repertoire or anything like that all within a year. This is a scaffolded approach to wanting to see change in the future. And the last thing, is just to call it out and question it. I've been looking at some of the questions and there are a lot of there are a lot of, you know, concerns with we can't just move away from this one thing that has been the monolith of our entire bassoon existence, learning how to play M Marriage of Figaro, learning how to play Mozart, learning all these standards that give us that Eurocentric credit of you're a good bassoon player. We're not going to change that all in one day or 55 minutes or anything like that, but I think it's important that we're calling it out and questioning it now. The more you question, the more we question and call out things, the more we can work together to strategize. I think it is so incredibly important, especially there, my fellow colleagues' generation, my generation, the generation after me who want to be in the bassoon world, we can't expect to completely flip the script on its head and then say, okay, good luck, hope that all works out for you, <laughs> you know. As like one of my teachers says, that's the, that is the exact opposite of creating an integrative approach for change, is asking for everything right now at this one time. So what Gina, I'd like I'd to do- to oh. back on that just real quick. No, and go for it. Um, I, I'm seeing lots of things coming through the chat too. And just acknowledge um, with love that we as musicians are, um, you know, it's so harped upon that we're in a competitive field that I think it's really easy for us in particular to get a scarcity mindset. And that if someone says, introduce this new thing, maybe it'll be helpful, that our minds immediately go to, well, what is that going to cost? How will I get, wh what am I going to have to give up in order to make space for this thing? And that that scarcity mindset that we default to is not necessarily even applicable. I. So I, I uh, really hope we can all keep that in mind as we think about these conversations. Although I want to add, you know, also with love and respect that there's a space that needs to be given, right? Because the state, that space has been centered in one demographic and one group for the longest time. So it is time to share the stage. And uh, I think that there's something to give up. And I think that we can all participate and we can all be part of it without uh, you know, losing opportunities. It's just the dynamics need to be challenged and the dynamics need to be uh, changed eventually. Absolutely. All right, we have about 10 more minutes for our q and I'm gonna go at the questions as they're being presented. Ladies, if there's anything in the chat as you're scrolling through that we need to address, please feel free to, to holler. That's, that's my word of the day. <laughs> All right, so one participant asked, one person has said and asked, I would argue that the internet has been the biggest help in bringing these composers to light. What do you think about the internet and more online connectivity that make this agenda more difficult? And what can we do to make it better? Um, I think 
they did they say to make it more difficult how how does the internet make it more difficult or um it, it says, what do you think it is about the internet and more online connectivity that makes this agenda more difficult? Oh, interesting. Yeah. No, 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 no. Uh, <laughs> please. Um, <laughs> uh, it's, you know, it's an interesting question because the agenda, um, the agenda is, I think, broad terms, more inclusivity and um uh, the, the flipping of the script, right? Um, so that everybody is included and um, everybody feels welcomed and there's um, not one, you know, group that's uh, um, put on a pedestal, I guess, but um, but everybody is collectively valued. Um, and I'm not sure that that would be, I'm not sure that that would be more difficult with the internet and maybe I'm, Maybe I'm not understanding the question correctly, but um, I think there's so many great opportunities with the internet um, to, and it has kind of expanded our our um, our, our worldview and um, given us opportunities to to have information at our fingertips, which um, which was not the case before. And I'll just take it to the level of you know. I don't, it's not politically, but, you know, like the world, the whole entire world, right, saw George Floyd die for eight minutes. Like, come on. I mean, that was crazy, right? But um, but it was a huge, you know, nothing like that could have ever happened without the internet, period, ever. You know, it's all of a sudden, like, instantaneously, this information is, like, sitting in front of people on their devices, you know, on their individual devices, kids are watching this stuff alone without their parents, like without even knowing it. And what it does is it, 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 um, I think in a lot of ways collectively and due to other stuff that's going on, of course, too, but, um, our, our minds are kind of being opened up and through something like that, it's like, you almost like can't stay sleeping. You know what I mean? How the term, woke you know it's almost like you can't not be woke after seeing that or you know like on your way to waking up so um so i think in jump for me um the internet has been a very positive thing overall i think there are definitely positive and negative aspects to the internet internet in general but um but overall i think in terms of what what this agenda is it i think I believe it has been positive in the way that it's brought more information to our to our fingertips. Philip is talking in the chat about uh, marginalized communities uh, that have been more marginalized by the internet. And I think that that's uh, there's a truth to it. Some communities that have not access to uh, you know technology as easy as many of us do. Uh, but in general, the positive that I have seen, uh, the positive effect of technology and the internet, I mean, look at us, right? Connected with people from all over the world in three nights already presenting more music by women composers than ever in the bassoon world. Uh, uh, to me, that is a great advantage of the internet and to the technology that we have in our fingers available. Awesome. All right, I think we have time for at least a few more questions. We're gonna put a hard stop at the noon time because I know we have um, guests who would absolutely love to go visit our ven the vendors at Met Quigley this afternoon. Um, the next question I see is, when it comes to reframing repertoire and giving voice to traditionally marginalized groups of people, what can you do as a person who is not in a position of authority without jeopardizing yourself? For example, as a student who is expected to play standard repertoire or perhaps, perhaps as a player of an orchestra or other large ensemble that primarily performs white Eurocentric music. Um, I would like to tackle that because I had this talk with Jackie this morning. I don't think challenging and re reframing and challenging the repertoire is jeopardizing your stake. I've done a little bit of social work research in hand in hand with Midori and some other colleagues about this idea of cultural capital. When you are advocating for marginalized communities, you are not sacrificing your cultural capital. You are adding to the cultural capital of the community in which you're trying to empower. 
you don't lose your credibility because you give a presentation about decentering whiteness as a black Okinawan, you know, Hispanic person, because that's what I am. Like, I don't lose you don't lose cultural capital by collaborating with me and reframing the conversation. Instead, you're adding to my capital and creating a space where we can all meet at that proverbial table that has been emphasized all summer long. Students will have to play the standard repertoire that's set up based on the system that is in place right now. But what we're aiming to do is to make more cracks into that system. So instead of it saying, this is the only way to be a good bassoon player, we're reframing it. Yeah, and I'll, can I add to that, Gina? Go for it. Um, there are going to be times when, I mean, you may have a teacher who's like, yeah, go for it, you know, and like gives you like tons of ideas and stuff like that. Or, or they say, you know, take charge and you do it yourself. Um, you may have a, a professor or a teacher who's like, no, you know, that's not standard. We're not about that right now, you know, and I think you have to kind of navigate those spaces uh, carefully. And so um, if there are opportunities for you to suggest something or if, you know, you can say, you know, actually, I really love this piece, you know, and this is why, you know, if you can say, if I, if I study this piece, these are the specific things that, you know, I will improve in my playing or I'll get to work on in my playing by, by studying this, then, you know, you're, you're bringing like hard facts, you know, something that's, you know, statistics, blah, 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 you know, something that people can say, oh, okay, well then, yeah, I mean, it's hard to argue with stuff like that, but, you know, if, if still you have pushback, then, you know, um, accept, I, f I feel like accept that in the moment and then, um, you know, work with what you have and improve in yourself. And then um, if you have opportunities to work on something else, or if you have an opportunity to prepare a recital in another context, like maybe during the summer or something like that, then, you know, you can choose basically anything you want. And, um, and then, if you, for some reason you have pushback at that time, you know, from, from your teacher, then just, you know, um, try again, try to give them hard reasons and facts why you believe that this is, had been, has been helpful. And then if, if you've really improved over the summer too, they can't really argue with that. <laughs> may, but, may, uh, this, may I add, Maya, that uh, I just want to remind, her, uh, remind everybody that equal rights are a human right. Right. So we, we come to this conversation apologetically sometimes, but there are times in which you just have to be a strong. This is a question of identity. And if I come and have to ask for, for permission to find myself in the music that I play, there's something wrong in this process. Right. And I know that it requires maybe years. And at some point in our careers, we have that agency. But the sooner we have that agency in hands, the better the world is going to be and the more balance we are going to encounter this, uh, this music world. Um, sometimes uh, I was very fortunately in my doctorate, uh, I was able to find myself in the repertoire of my final paper, right, and play Colombian composers. And that opened a lot of uh, opportunities and I had the support of my professor. But if that's not the, the case, maybe sometimes we have to think hard. If this orchestra is not playing me, Maybe I need to find another opportunity. If this chamber group is not allowing me to be myself, maybe I need to change my chamber ensemble. Or maybe I have to leave this board of directors. Or maybe I have to not be in this organization. So those are hard decisions for us minorities, but I encourage everybody to think about that as well. Because this is our right to be visible, to be taken into consideration as the human beings we are. Yes. And I'll, I'll just add to that really, really quickly. Oh, never mind. <laughs> never mind. No, oh, it's okay, Baya. Um, so what we're going to do is I just want to share the infographic with you all in case you all ha did not have access to into checks. I want to do the hard stop at noon. It is a fantastic conversation in the chat. Meg Quigley team, I hope there's a way to extract those questions so we can answer them together as a team. All right. Let me go here real quick. Okay, awesome. So what we have here... Can everyone hear me okay still? Yes. Awesome. Um, this is just a very basic outline of what we talked about together today. There's one thing we didn't go over, but I'm more than happy if you send me an email to describe that to you. And that's the being great in ensembles. And it's talking about providing more empathy within our ensemble setups. Oh my goodness. Mood. Mood. All right. And 
I also attached all of our contact information if you ladies have any questions. I know um, Jackie needs to head on out to the vendor slot because it is indeed time for that. I'll try to answer any other remaining questions in the chat, but I just wanted to thank my panel from the bottom of my heart for taking the time to work on this with me. It's been a passion project for a really long time and it's been an honor to share it with everyone at Quigley today. Thank you so much, Gina. Yeah, thank you, Gina. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. What a fantastic opportunity to get together and uh, what an honor to be here with all of you talking about these issues. And everybody, I hope everybody commits to change and lives today with a strategy or more, more than one to go and change your world and your communities surrounding you. Jackie, if you need to, to leave the room, I think that would be fine. Thank you. But if, if you guys want to stay and answer more questions, um, I think we could do that. But we do want to encourage anyone who wants to go visit the vendors that now is the time to do that. We've got um, Forest Music. We've got um, Miller Marketing and Go Bassoon. So um, go ahead and check them out. But if, if you guys want to stay and answer some more questions, either in the Q&A or in this very long chat, and I think we will try to save the chat. Um, I don't know if we'll publish that for everyone, but um, certainly we can pass those questions on to these fine panelists um, so they can, they can answer those questions. Awesome. So there is one question, Midori, in the chat, in the Q&A that I think we can tackle real quick here together. It's talking about if you, when you're rejecting standard repertoire, do you receive any pushback from your administration? And how do you continue your advocacy if and or when that happens? And also what does your administration look like? And if that impacts how they react to your push for reframing repertoire? Um, I, I, I don't get pushback. Um, I think there's enough um, there's a lot of white guilt in the spaces that I'm in and, and, um, maybe it's opportunistic, but that's helpful. Um, it, it, sometimes it can also be dangerous, but, um, I, I don't get pushback. And in the situation where I would, that's not the right organization. So, um, to protect my own resilience, I would probably walk away. Um, but. But that's also why I do a lot of projects where I have complete autonomies because then, then there's no pushback. But I don't really get that. That is such a great uh, comment, Midori, and thank you for saying that. And again, for whoever is still here that is a minority, self-care is super important, right? And, uh, and being able to, to stand there with who you are, right? And, and, and make decisions about uh, to what extent you want to be exposed to that if you have the support you need or if it's better just to walk away and tackle a different project in which you know you can be more successful. And I think we also talked early on, just as a team of five, about having a teammate who, who it, it, we're like stronger when we're together too. So if there's two or five or 10 people who are pushing for that, then there's, there really isn't room for pushback anyway. It's a lot easier to push back on one person, but um, we talked about collaboration with each other to fight for this stuff. And that's what it is uh, important to have that representation at every level, right? Right, right? Because if you're the only the only person of color in that board or the only person of color in that committee making decisions about repertoire or the only student of color in the studio, it's more difficult to tackle the situation. So mm -hmm. um, it is important to create these spaces. I, I feel really excited about actually this group of the five of us, right, that have found in each other this relationship and we can come back and have and continue having these conversations in preparation for this panel. I learned so much from their experiences and from the subject itself. So that's uh, perhaps another important thing to think about. Who's, uh, who's in your group and where do you go to have mm -hmm. these conversations to get the support and the knowledge, the inspiration to continue this fight? Mm -hmm. And I also wanted to highlight that we're all here for everybody. This doesn't end just in the next, you know, five or so minutes when the panel room closes. We want to build this community with you all. And I think it is so very important to know you're never alone. If you have a question, there are five incredible BIPOC women in your community who want to collaborate with you. <laughs> I love it. Many questions. others. Huh? And many <laughs> yeah. others, absolutely. And many others. And, 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 you know, it would be great to 
to really expand these opportunities, uh, I, I really value. I'm really excited about Meg Quigley this week. I have learned so much <laughs> and I have seen this change uh, and this moving of everything, but, uh, but those uh, talks and, and continuing these opportunities, we need to open this, you know, for a monthly conversation where everybody can come and then we can just get better because the more we talk about this, no, no matter who we are, whatever the identities are, is normalizing this conversation. So we get better also at disrupting, right? It takes practice and it's safer in this space. And it's very difficult when we go to spaces in which we, again, are minorities. And that minority is anything, including being a woman. I just want to say too, I'm just taking a look, a little brief look through the, the chat and it's really amazingly encouraging to see the conversation that's happening and the desire, you know, for change and like taking it, people taking it into their own hands. That is so powerful and strong for us and to see it happening on this huge chat, you know, where people are agreeing. Um, so just want to say that's, that's really awesome. Incredible. The change is happening. Encouraging. Incredible. Yeah. Incredible. I also, I wanted to say one more thing. I'm not even sure if they're still here, but say one thing about the internet question. Um, and I, I do have an idea of a consequence. Um, we've talked a lot about humanness and humanizing in our conversations as five people. Um, and I saw one of the consequences of just like information overload, like too easy access. Um, there was a database that was going really viral and getting famous where you could basically like click through which identities you wanted a composer to be, what, what was their race, what was their gender identity, all these different things that put human people <laughs> into boxes, um, into categories that you could check off. And mm. I think the like easy access to that, um, how quick it was, how bit massive it was, was a huge consequence because it took away the humanness of what that interaction should be, um, what programming a piece of music should be. It should not be checking off a box because someone is um, non-binary and black and they wrote a piece. That's not why you program a piece. Um, so that came to mind as one consequence. And, and one of the solutions I saw it appear in the chat was this um, spreadsheet kind of created in response to that, which was a lot more humanizing called No Broken Links. Um, Jessica linked to it from Brandon Scott Rumsey. And that one takes a much more human grassroots approach to the same problem that we're trying to solve. There it is, yeah. <laughs> well, should we go visit the vendors too? Yeah, I think it's about time to end this meeting. Thank you again for everyone who stayed extra. Um, we really appreciate your your presence. If you'd like to um, kind of continue this discussion, there's been a couple different posts in the chat that our YouTube channel does have recordings from our summer series where we had some of these same lovely people um, talking about some of these same ideas. So um, we hope you'll check that out if you have time. And we look forward to seeing you at the rest of the events today. We've got our first Quiggle videos and we can't wait to show those off. Um, at 2 p.m. and lots of other great stuff. So see you all in another room somewhere on the internet. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank, you, Thank you, Gina. Thank you, everyone here for organizing Gracias. such a wonderful panel. Thank you. <laughs> Adios.